dance off, bro. Me and you. Hello again. Or if you're new, welcome. And welcome, everyone, to the newly constructed Senseless Sensei classroom. Take your seats. Class is now in session. We're continuing the adventures of City Kid and technically champion figure skater Shirakawa Ro as he moves to a rural area known for their record-holding hockey team, Oi no Kami. When last we left our hero, Ro had taken issue with Genma Keiichi's violent treatment of anyone who got near the goal net on the local frozen pond. Keiichi predictably then took issue with Ro deliberately skating near that exact same goal, and the gauntlet is literally thrown when Ro challenges little Genma by tossing a glove into his opponent's face. Picking up from there, Ro states that the winner of their showdown will gain the right to use the frozen pond. A stern look from Keiichi is followed by warnings from the children. The warnings fall on deaf ears, however, as Ro begins snapping his fingers and doing a step sequence while declaring that they'll be participating in... A dance-off, bro! Hilariously, Ro finds out for himself what a glove to the face feels like. In this case, it's even a hockey glove, far heavier than the thin gloves that Ro had weaponized thus far. KG doubles down on his threats by informing Ro that he now plans to draw a full-on hockey rink in Ro's blood. The quarrel is suddenly interrupted by someone on the edge of the pond yelling for Keiichi to knock it off. It's Genma Koichi, goalie for Oi no Kami, an older brother to Keiichi. Koichi is decked out in his goalie gear, sporting a 1995 Patrick Roy No. 33 Colorado Avalanche jersey, which is oddly specific, and I had to do some research to find that out. Keiichi ignores his brother and continues to issue threats that Ro simply shrugs off with his own verbal jabs. Words quickly become action as Ro gleefully skates around the goal with little Genma in hot pursuit. All the while, Big Genma notices Ro's skating prowess and calls him out as the Rabbit Prince, much to Ro's chagrin. However, the conflict continues when Keiichi attempts to read Ro's movements, only to be deftly juked out, much to the surprise of the elder Genma brother. Ro doesn't make a clean escape though, instead feeling the wrath of little Genma's hockey stick as it connects directly with Ro's crotch. Even worse, Keiichi is apparently strong enough to then lift up his stick with Ro on it and throw him into the air. Into the air, and directly into his precious goal, which then proceeds to break the ice and sink to the bottom of the pond, despite little Genma risking hypothermia to save it. Koichi stops his little brother from freezing in the pond and attempts to end a new fight now over the responsibility for the goal. Keiichi backfists his brother for trying to pull him away, which Koichi swiftly follows up with a solid punch of his own. The two steadily exchange blows until Koichi finally talks some sense into his younger brother. As the brothers make their way off the ice to get little Genma to shelter, we finally learn why the goal mattered so much in the first place. You see, the Genma brothers had a ritual. Every year, they would practice on that pond before any important games, and every night, the younger brother would spread water to make ice around the goal. Koichi even comments that as a figure skater, surely Ro can understand how important such things are. With that comment, we flash back to Ro entering the rink at the beginning of chapter 1, shedding some light on the movements that he was making as he prepared for his routine. Ro, with a little more perspective on the situation, apologizes for his part in the fight and offers to find a new goal for the pond. Koichi tells Ro not to worry about it, but he does make sure to tell Ro that just because he was banned from figure skating doesn't mean he should waste his skills as a skater. Back at the grandfather's home, our hero is wearing curiously science-themed pajamas and stretching out on his futon while surrounded by empty bottles of water. I'm not sure if all the water is from him exercising or from being in the colder climate of Hokkaido, but it's a considerable amount of water to consume. Ro ponders how to be less of a burden to his grandfather while Haruna updates the skating club on how Ro is handling everything that's happened. If he wanted to quit, he'd have left his skates in Tokyo, right? The following day, we're introduced to the Miyamori Junior High Hockey Team, or rather what's left of it as they're one member short of having enough, prompting one of their members, Dohi Nobuto, to beg a speed skater to simply stand on the sidelines just so that they can play. The situation has team captain Kosugi Yuki considering just throwing in the towel, a thought which is vehemently rejected by Dohi. Luckily for Dohi, Ro happens upon the team's old goal net and asks for permission to take it. Kosugi is ready to let it go, but Dohi springs on the opportunity and strikes up a deal with Ro. Play with them in a game, and the goal is his. After agreeing to the terms, Dohi informs Ro that the match is in two hours and they don't have any gear for him to wear after having already borrowed everything they could just to cobble together the rest of the team's gear. Fortunately, Ro recalls the hockey equipment stored in the closet back at the house from when he was being attacked by the cat. 
In the locker room, Ro's grandfather reminisces on having the gear since his youth, never dreaming that he'd pass it on to his grandson. Ro immediately ruins the moment by asking if anyone has deodorizer to use on the old leather padding. Taking to the ice, we meet the Hokuryo Junior High team, with its maxed out roster of 22 players versus the minimum roster 12 that comprise Miyamori's side. Ro is clearly unsure of how hockey works, but he's even more unsure of why Dohi is speaking so dramatically, only to find out that he's commentating for a live stream of the match while he's playing. Beanie Kid and Tomoko from the Frozen Pond earlier are in the bleachers with a camera and laptop, ready to capture the game for their audience. Curiously, Kosuki is shown bowing to Hokuryo's coach, a man named Kitajima Tomohiro, who respectfully returns the bow. Kosuki is visibly uneasy after their brief encounter, a fact which doesn't escape Ro's notice. Before he can ask about it, Dohi drops the bombshell that Hokuryo's captain is none other than Genma Draw Rink in Your Blood Keiichi. Keiichi skates up and inquires about the Miyamori team's faculty advisor, who apparently isn't one for showing up in public. The conversation comes to an abrupt halt when little Genma notices Ro sparkling as he makes an effort to show off his name taped to the back of his jersey. The two butt face masks, trading insults and then breaking to their sides again. Genma declares that Miyamori won't score a single goal in the game before telling them that hockey is a battlefield, no place for a figure skater to be. Dohi's commentary on the strength of Hokuryo's team prompts concern from Ro, who seems to be feeling more and more hoodwinked as events play out. I love the endlessly dramatic comparison that Dohi makes to the Battle of Shizugatake, a very real battle that happened during the Sengoku period of Japan. Without going into too much detail, the battle was fought between Shibata Katsuie and Hashiba Hideyoshi, both of whom were former retainers of the great unifier of Japan, Oda Nobunaga. The battle was a culmination of aggressions between the two following a dispute over succession after the assassination of Oda Nobunaga. According to legend, Hideyoshi and his army traveled 52 kilometers in only 5 hours to support the army that had just secured Shizugatake Fort. Hideyoshi won the battle and eventually became regarded as the second great unifier of Japan. All in all, the analogy paints an incredibly bleak picture for the Miyamori team, especially when half of the makeshift team they have are compared to poodles. As the teams take their position for the first quarter, Ro is in good spirits after realizing that, despite their sore lack of members, only six members on each team are allowed on the ice at once. Having even teams at play boosts his confidence while Kosuki jabs at him for thinking that it would be pandemonium on the rink. Genma and Dohi square up for the face-off, the hockey equivalent to when basketball players jump for a ball to see who gets possession. In a moment that actually had me choke on my drink, Ro, or ignorant Ro, poses like some sort of ballet angel of judgment right next to the two as they're preparing to face off. The look on Keiichi's face is priceless, just utterly astounded by the sudden intrusion until Dohi tells Ro to get into position. After Ro's intrusion, a player from Hokuryo named Fujiyoshio taunts Kosugi on their clueless stand-in. Kosugi responds coldly, going as far as calling Yoshio a traitor. These two clearly have history and some sort of beef with each other over something Yoshio did. We don't get any additional insight on this due to the puck dropping on the ice and being shot right past a shocked and confused Row. Our protagonist does his best to keep up, only to be shoulder checked into the wall by none other than Genma Keiichi. Kosugi manages to slap the puck over Keiichi's stick and back towards Row, who accidentally scoops it with his stick, causing it to fly into the air and hit himself in the face mask. To add injury to insult, Keiichi slams Row into the boards for a second time. But Ro isn't taking it lying down. No, Ro sits up on the ice and retaliates by hooking his stick into little Genma's crotch as he's skating away. A fitting revenge for Ro after what went down at the frozen pond the day before. Unfortunately, it's also illegal in hockey to hook players with a stick, so Ro receives a two minute banishment to the penalty box, or the sin bin, as Keiichi refers to it. This leaves Miyamori in a 5 vs 6 situation until Ro can return to the ice, giving Ro's frustratingly yet unnamed grandfather time to talk to his grandson. That is, until Haruna appears beside the penalty box and recognizes Ro, who denies the fact while going cross-eyed in an attempt to obscure his identity. Turns out that Haruna and the other students were told to come watch the final tournament before the school closes. Oddly enough, Haruna mentions that it was the mysterious team advisor that had suggested the students come watch the game unfold. Ro is shocked at the news that the school is even closing, having overlooked that fact when he applied to transfer schools in the first place. When he and his fellow third-year students graduate to high school in a few months, the school won't have enough students to stay open. While the family discusses the fate of the school, Okurio scored a goal, ending Ro's time in the penalty box. Upon re-entering the game, though, Ro is not happy with Dohi and Kosugi over deceiving him. 
He feels that they lied about needing the extra goal net from earlier, seeing as how this was the last game the school would ever play anyways. Kosugi shoots back at Ro for thinking it should have just been free then, and though he apologizes for the Sutterfuge, but Miyamori's final hockey team wanted to play no matter what. Kosugi explains to Ro that they haven't scored a goal all season, but Dohi is determined to stick it to Hokuryo. Ro asks what they have against their opponents, and we gain some insight into the earlier scene of Kosugi and Coach Kitajima. Until two years ago, when the school announced that it would be closing, Kitajima had been the coach of a formidable Miyamori hockey team. Hokuryo took advantage of the situation and swooped Kitajima up for themselves, resulting in players leaving the team for Hokuryo or out of frustration in the aftermath of losing their coach. To make matters worse, no new players wanted to join the team over the preceding years, which is how we came to find Miyamori one man short just a couple of hours ago. Ro asks the other members why they didn't join Hokuryo as well, eliciting a look of anger from Kosugi, while Dohi starts to fill in the gaps for Ro and all of us. Back in time to winter of last year, Kitajima had approached both Kosugi and Yoshio with prospects of joining Hokuryo. After all, the two had potential and their former coach knew that very well. Kosugi's request to bring the others from Miyamori with him was swiftly denied, resulting in him returning to Miyamori to discuss it with his team. After they try to convince him to transfer, he makes the choice to stay there at Miyamori and teach Hokuryo a lesson with his team. Returning to the game in progress, Kosugi looks almost regretful. I'm not sure if deep down he regrets staying at Miyamori, which in turn led to a brutal season of consecutive defeats, or because a part of him did want to join Hokuryo. A line change is called as players return to the bench and swap in for new players. On their way into the arena, Ro praises Kosugi for his choice to stay and stick it out with his teammates, showing a newfound respect for the captain. Haruna watches from the sidelines with her grandfather, openly wondering why Ro would bother with a team sport when he's such a snob in her opinion. Her face changes rapidly after overhearing Miyamori is not only playing against their former teammates, but that this is like a game between the chosen elites and the abandoned losers. This could be an indication that the twins had been in a similar situation before, possibly being looked down on by some elitist skaters or their families over the years. That would explain why Ro feels so strongly after hearing the team's story, and possibly why he's so adamant in facing those that he feels are bullies like Little Genma. It's speculation, I admit, so we'll see what the real story ends up being. Back on the ice, Keiichi is racing for the puck, only to see Ro come gliding by, crouching down for more speed. Genma goes for a third shoulder check, but this time Ro is ready for it, leaning backwards from the knees to duck the incoming attack. The crowd is shocked as our hero is in a position to finally make a comeback after blundering through the game so far. The crowd exclaims in confusion and Haruna coldly states that it's a solo cantilever, not even batting an eye at the maneuver. Ro begins his comeback by grabbing the puck off of the ice, sending a very different wave of confusion across the players and audience. With brilliant grace and literally sparkling enthusiasm, Ro dances his way around the bewildered Hokuryo players on his way to their goal. He throws the puck back down on the ice with dramatic intensity, readying his shot on the goal. A shot that he whiffs so badly that he falls on his back and barely touches the puck with his stick. And to the surprise of nobody, Ro is sent once again to the sin bin for breaking rules. The onlookers turn on Ro, berating his antics and telling him to take this seriously. In Ro's defense this time, he saw little Genma use a hand to stop the puck in the air, but he didn't know that it also had to drop back onto the ice. While Ro curses the rules of the sport, Miyamori is calling another line change when Dohi notices something, or rather someone. Hey, it's him! It's the guy! The guy who got shafted in the chapter 1 color page! He's perched himself onto one of the walls, staring intently into the rink like a wild animal sizing up threats in its environment. This man is none other than Oi no Kami's coach, Nihei Toshimitsu someone who Keiichi shows a clear respect for. Oinokami themselves have just showed up to practice after the match and are quick to comment on the one-sidedness of the game. Meanwhile, Ro gets sage advice from his grandfather on playing better. Skate, and use your stick to hit the puck. Wisdom that rivals the old adage, get your opponent's health down to zero, while keeping your health above zero. Regardless, Ro seems okay with it, but Keiichi is also feeling more motivated after knowing the coach of his dream team is watching leading him to aggressively score six more goals. Line changing once again, Ro asks Dohi when he's supposed to know how to change out, learning that it's done whenever the player slows down because of a buildup of lactic acid in the muscles. The rapid changing of lines is what puts Miyamori at such a heavy disadvantage against a full roster team like Hokuryo. Less players means swapping in more often and getting less rest in between changes for the entire duration of the game. 
Kosugi repeats his catchphrase of why are we even trying, to which Ro replies by telling him that he'll make this booing crowd cheer. Cutting back to wild man coach Nihei, he's being approached by a man wearing a staff badge. We don't get his name, but I suspect that this could be the faculty advisor that's so elusive, slinking in for a conversation with Nihei who clearly has his eyes set on Ro. Nihei even calls Ro weird after seeing him trick Yoshio into going the wrong way with his skating skills. I don't think it's meant as an insult, so much as in understanding that he's got potential despite being as unorthodox as it gets. It's also satisfying to see Yoshio look like a fool, what with him being a traitor and all. With that though, we've reached the end of our time for this lesson. If you're new here, introduce yourself to the class down below, and make sure to subscribe so that you don't miss the next lesson. Stay warm, and don't betray your friends. Class dismissed.